eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hell. Hello, hello, healthy people. Have you been eating a sapien diet recently? Are you feeling better than ever? Or is it just me? Many people are probably doing it without even realizing it. It's basically just a high animal food, high fat, low carb, low anti-nutrient diet with a condensed eating window. We talk a lot about why this way of eating is so beneficial and so misunderstood today with the legendary Nina Teicholz. She's an adjunct professor at NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, the executive director of the Nutrition Coalition, a group devoted to evidence-based nutrition policy, an investigative science journalist and author of the must-read book, Big Fat Surprise. Just go read it now, seriously. She spent almost 10 years researching and digging up studies to blow the top off of one of the biggest mistakes in human history. Yes, she says it. Demonizing cholesterol and human health foods like red meat and saturated fat has truly been a catastrophe for the health of our world. She got in this early and made waves, woke people up, and got the movement going. She and Gary Tobbs have been instrumental in getting the word out to the mainstream. Listen up, everyone. She's awesome. I have a few more things before we start, though. We're actually still looking for a story or two to weave into the film. If you know a family whose kids have lost a ton of weight, I'd love to hear from them. I'm also interested in connecting with an LA-based editor and videographer that can help make some more YouTube content with us. We have a lot of things cooking and not enough chefs. Do you have pets? We've got the healthiest pet food possible at nosetotail.org. It's grass-finished ground beef with all the organs in it, especially made for animals. Get some for yourself while you're at it. We make it for humans too. We also have high omega-3 pork and chicken that's pasture-raised and fed a special diet. The meat and fat are loaded with possibly the best omega-3 to omega-6 ratio in America. Get it delivered to you with a few clicks at nosetotail.org. We're restocking on Friday, so I'll add the products back in stock Wednesday, which is when this podcast is coming out, and we always ship on Mondays and Tuesdays. So please support the film on Indiegogo by clicking through the show notes or foodlies.org. We're about to make another order of the It's What Else You Eat, Not The Meat shirts. You can get one with a pre-order copy of the film. Support this show on Patreon and get the extended show notes on patreon.com slash peakhuman. Please support us there. It's super important and I really appreciate it. And subscribe to the new Sapien Show on any podcast app or YouTube. We film video and audio at Evolve Healthcare in Los Angeles with Dr. Gary and some really interesting guests. Just search for Sapien. So here we have it, the ex-longtime vegetarian turned eater of meat, butter, eggs, and cheese, Nina Teicholz. Well, we're recording. Welcome, Hi. Nina Teicholz. Hello. Great to talk to you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, great to talk to you again. We've talked many times, I guess, over the past almost two years. Yeah, and well, you've we been making filmed your with movie. You twice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope your movie's going well. I'm excited it's, about it. it's coming out. <laughs> it's going really well. We the first time yeah we filmed with you in Ohio, we had a little audio interference. We also filmed with you a third time, if you count with Professor Tim Noakes, Gary Tobbs, and Dominic D'Agostino. Right, that was an interesting conversation that we had at Ohio State. Yeah, we wanted to do something different and get all you guys talking and, you know, just theorizing about what we can do about all this. And I thought that was pretty fun. It was. It was totally unique and interesting. It should happen more often. Roundtables on how to change the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what you're trying to do. So that's why I've been excited to have you on Thank for you. a while now. I've talked to all kinds of people. I'm trying to get the whole picture here. All sides. You know, I talk to people I don't even agree with on this Great. podcast, but luckily I agree with you on everything. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe most things. It's most good to things. talk to people across the aisle. It's good to be challenged. So I salute you for that. Yes. And you know, the first time we talked was very early. We actually had a phone call. I don't know if you even remember this. Where And I was, I was kind of telling you what I was doing and you had some great ideas for the film. You know, you're talking about, you were in Washington. I know you're in New York now. I'm but. in New York City. No, I've always lived in New York City. Okay, you're just going to Washington. You're like, you should see the inside workings of Washington or get in these rooms. <laughs> I was like, I wish I want to do that. Because like, you've been on the inside of you. You've heard these discussions. 
Well, that has been an amazing part of my education since, you know, I'm a journalist and I spent nearly a decade writing a book and I studied the science in so much depth. And, you know, I studied the politics. Like one of the things in writing my book was to realize, okay, I, I think I'm writing about science, but it turns out I'm writing about politics, the mm -hmm. politics of how the science really got silenced, right? And ignored. And then I started this not-for-profit organization called the Nutrition Coalition. And its aim and hope and ambition was to take an alternative point of view to Washington, you know, an, an alternative point of view being that maybe it wasn't true that the guidelines, I mean, everybody assumes that our dietary guidelines, which are super all powerful, they control school lunches, military rations, hospital food, every doctor, nutritionist, dietitian, nurse, everybody is delivering the guidelines. So, you know, I started off thinking, well, who cares about the guidelines? Like, mm -hmm. I don't, <laughs> I don't listen to my government to tell me what to eat. But it turns out the guidelines, even though you don't know about them, they know about you, they reach out to each and every American through your doctor or your K through 12 health classes, all based on the guidelines. So I realized there was this hugely important policy that everybody the conventional thinking on it was this policy is correct. Telling Americans to eat 50 to 55% of their calories is carbohydrates, mostly fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and, you know, keep low your meat and your dairy. And if you have them, make sure they're low fat and eat vegetable oils, not butter or, you know, I mean, all of that. Everybody is, assumes in Washington, they're like, this is correct. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that people don't follow them. People fail to follow the guidelines. If only we could get the American public to do a better job. But they do. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting because, you know, I had my personal story and so many people do, which is trying so hard to like, you know, basically be a poster child for the guidelines, you know, mm -hmm. wrapping your fish in tin foil so you can cook it without any fat and avoiding all fat and having only vinegar on your salad, which by the way, tastes awful. And, mm -hmm. um, but when I looked at the larger data for all the American population, there was there's virtually no category of food consumption where we have not followed the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Like red meat consumption down by 28%, beef is down by 35%, butter is down by nearly 20%, whole milk is down by 79% um, since 1970, all these numbers. And what is up? Fruits and vegetable consumption, surprisingly, up by 20 to 35%. And grain consumption is up. And vegetable oil consumption is way up, almost 90%. Like we have 100% done as we were told, but we all feel so guilty. Like if only I tried harder, did more, ran more, restricted my diet better. So I was just trying to present this new idea that nobody had ever really thought about in Washington, which is, you know, maybe we should really challenge our guidelines. They have, they were launched in 1980. They have overseen the explosion of the <laughs> obesity and diabetes epidemics. Like, could we just imagine that, that, that the guidelines, you know, have been ineffective in combating a disease? And can we imagine that maybe we got it wrong? That line, that graph is great. We're using that for the film. It's in the trailer. It's just right when 1980, <laughs> when they're introduced, it skyrockets up. Obesity. Yeah. Rates of obesity skyrocket up in the very same year that the dietary guidelines are launched. And that's just a correlation. It's not causation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you know, you have to ask yourself, that's a real, it's a sharp upward turn in rates of obesity. And what happened? All of a sudden, you know, all cattle were bred to be leaner. All, you know, the government told the food industry, we need 3,000 products tomorrow that are low fat. Uh, we need them in the supermarket shelves. Everybody, all school lunches, all feeding programs for the elderly, all military rations, like everything became low fat. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed in 1980 is that we lowered our fat and we dramatically increased our carbohydrates. We cannot prove that the guidelines, nobody can prove that the guidelines caused our epidemics, but we have a body of science that show if people ignore the guidelines and follow a dramatically different diet, which is higher in fat and lower in carbs, that they can reverse their disease or manage it better. Mm -hmm. And that suggests that these guidelines are, you know, are not promoting health, right? Yeah. That very different diets promote health. 
So anyway, just to your point about Washington, I mean, these ideas in Washington, nobody has ever spoken them as like <laughs> no one's challenged them. Yeah, it's like just like some bizarre person from outer space landing to say <laughs> <laughs> maybe we Hello. should look at this. Yeah. <laughs> let's all that what we're doing is not working. And let's just be open to other ideas. Why not just be open to them? Well, other ideas as in what we've been doing for all of history, <laughs> like just normal human diets. It's really funny to me that people don't realize that this is this new way of eating is new and that maybe it was a mistake. It's kind of what you're saying, right? I, there was actually a great quote from your book. I want to tell it back to you. Because you said it when we Good, were filming. Because I'm sure I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it just makes this point. He said, but like lost languages, lost skills, and lost songs, it takes only a few generations to forget. I love that. It's like your great grandma knew she was eating butter. She was eating bacon. She was cooking roasts. You know, this is, it's not like some crazy thing. Like you and Gary Tobbs, you guys seem like you're these like crazy people from outer space. Like you said, you're like challenging this big system. You're like, no, we're just saying, let's go back to the way we used to eat. It's so true. I think that it relates to another realization I had when I was writing that line, which is, you know, in school when they say, you have to study history or you repeat the mistakes of history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always thought, well, okay, I'll study history, but it didn't seem so relevant. And then I studied the history of diet and I realized this is a lost history. If we lose our history, we lose all the wisdom of what we've accumulated on how to live healthfully. And that's what's happened. So, mm -hmm. you know, 20 year old today has never known anything other than a diet, you know, vegetable oils and fruits and vegetables and red meat is bad for you. That's all they know. And their mom is likely to be somebody who, like me, raised on a low fat diet is, you know, dreads fat, thinks that, you know, do anything to avoid fat, probably still distrust egg yolks and shellfish. I mean, so that's their experience in life. Mm -hmm. And that's all we know. We just don't remember. And we don't we even remember, we can't remember a time when the population was healthy. It seems normal to us that everybody should have cancer and heart disease and be overweight. It's just normal. That's the new normal. And we're, mm. we, you know, we try to reckon with it by saying, look, it's okay to be fat and overweight because that is our new normal. And nobody wants to make people feel badly, but that was really not always the case. Yeah. And it's not so long ago. You know, if you go back and look at pictures of people waiting in lines for like a Star Wars movie in the mm -hmm. 70s. <laughs> There's just not a single overweight person in line. Yeah, It's amazing. <laughs> we, we have old footage of that stuff. I think Vinnie Tortor did that in his film as well, uh, which you're in and, and is great. That, yeah, we didn't have it. And this body shaming movement, of course I don't promote our body positivity movement. Of course I don't promote body shaming, but it's not, we're trying to embrace it as it's fine and it's healthy and it's great and you're you're great, right? It's just, it's because of what we're eating. It's not their fault, but that's the other part of the story is it, it isn't their fault, Correct. right? It's like they we got the wrong information, we're eating the wrong foods. And there's so many things I want to talk about, but I'm thinking about how you just think being unhealthy is normal. This is just what I posted yesterday of my story of, of me being like this skinny fat like guy that was sick all the time and had all these little problems. And all I did was change the way I ate. I didn't count calories. I didn't do anything different other than my food choice. And everything changed. My whole body composition changed. I don't get sick. All the things you think are normal, right? You're just like, oh, you're just supposed to like feel bloated or you just get headaches or you just are tired. All these things you think are normal are completely not normal. Right. It is revelatory because, of course, we're so used to being sick and feeling bad and 80. Uh, there's just so many ways in which we're used to feeling terrible. I barely know a, a young person without some kind of serious disease of some kind, some autoimmune problem or some Mental bowel stuff issue too. or, you know, yeah, I mean. Anxiety. Yeah, there's all this like, anxiety and depression these days. And I swear it's from the la not eating enough meat and having like a, just all these like gut brain access problems. But it's very hard. I mean, trying to change this debate, which is what we're talking about, is really challenging because this idea that we should all be eating a low fat, you know, a diet that's mainly around, you know, mainly a plant-based, mm -hmm. grain-based diet. That idea is 
institutionalized, enshrined in our expert class at, at the highest levels. Um, it has now a vast array of corporate interest behind it mm -hmm. because of course, I mean, they, you know, they invest in what the, in what the status quo is. And so there's a number of any number of food companies and other kinds of companies that are invested in this model. This model works for them. And so they have promoted this model and they've promoted it even further to say like, now we really need to move towards a vegan diet. Let's just exit animal foods altogether. And that is so powerful as a PR idea. And so presenting alternative views, I mean, even just talking about the nutrient density of animal foods, for instance, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. almost impossible to introduce these kinds of ideas in this climate. Yeah, no one wants to hear about it. And you're like, oh, so what? So like, you know, eating kale is bad. They're so tied to these thoughts that we had. And it makes perfect sense because the profit margins are all in the processed foods. It's not like an accident that the all the foods that have the long shelf life and all the cheap ingredients stuffed in are where they're making the money and they want to keep making that money. And Well, and now they can call themselves vegan. You know, yeah. you can now you get the vegan heart health halo, you know, on top of it, not just heart health, but, you know, environmental, you get the environmental stamp of approval, you get a whole halo above your vegan choices. But what are the cheapest foods? What makes up those middle, all the central aisles of the supermarket are foods that are made up of, you know, principally the, the major ingredients are grains, vegetable oils, salt and sugar, you know, mm -hmm. cookies, crackers, chips, they're, they're all made up of some formulation of those ingredients, mm -hmm. um, and cereals. And so those are the absolute cheapest foods. Those are the foods, you know, grains are the foods of peasants. Mm -hmm. We have managed to convince ourselves somehow, or, or we've been convinced of this idea that those are you know, the best foods for us that we should we privileged people should eat like peasants. <laughs> <laughs> it's very weird. Or even just fallback food. I always just call them fallback foods. It's like these foods, humans evolved to be able to handle not getting a, an animal. And we have these fallback foods. It's just confusing why people these days, especially these wealthy people, you know, the, in cities, they like choose to try to rely. Why You're building your diet on the fallback foods. It's very odd. Well, our heads have been twisted around for decades, really going back to the early 1960s, late 1950s. So, I mean, we have been, we have been barreling along this, along with a set of untruths about diet that it's just been going on for decades. So, uh, let's talk about it. I know you've done this probably 10,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> Go over the story or your book, Big Fat Surprise. Amazing book. Thank Everyone you. has to read it. It was one of the first books I read when I really got going on this journey. And, and it was, it's like your mind's blown every page. So what is this story like starting in the 50s? Well, it starts earlier. Well, I don't want to bore your listeners who may have heard this already, but um, and, and many people do now. But this really the story of Ansel Keys, it really food was enjoyed and considered a pleasure and source of nourishment through the early was not considered it was not medicalized and considered something that you needed to mm. calculate out along with your physician on a prescription pad <laughs> really until the 1950s all of that changed and that was because heart disease which had been pretty much non-existent in the early 1900s had risen to become the nation's number one killer disease and it was genuinely terrifying for people. Men whose fathers had lived long lives, had never had heart disease, all of a sudden they in their 40s and 50s were dropping dead of this, this disease out of nowhere. I mean, just imagine how scary that is. Many of us know the story of President Eisenhower who had a heart attack in 1955 and was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. How terrifying to the country was that? Mm -hmm. And it focused the nation's panic on this question of, what caused heart disease? What was the reason? There were a number of reasonable in explanations that were proffered by various scientists. One of them that it was vitamin deficiency. Others thought it had to do with the rising um, amount of auto exhaust on the roads. Others said that it was a type A personality. You go mm -hmm. around screaming at everybody and then you, <laughs> you like, yeah. 
you you fall down with a heart attack. And then there was Ansel Keys, the um, pathologist from the University of Minnesota, who said it was saturated fat and cholesterol, his diet heart hypothesis, which was saturated fat and cholesterol would clog your arteries like hot oil down a cold pipe, and that would lead to a heart attack. And again, as many people know, he was a very powerful, uh, self-confident, aggressive, influential person. He had, um, and he managed to elbow his way onto the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association, which was really the only public health authority at the time that was paying attention to heart disease, was the leader in the field, such that in 1961, the first recommendations anywhere in the world to limit your saturated fat and cholesterol to prevent heart attacks was issued by the American Heart Association. That is where it all began. Mm -hmm. That is the first time. At that point, it was only for men because only men were getting heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Now we have become an equal opportunity diseased population, but um, that's where it all began. And it wasn't even the low fat diet then, it was just saturated fats. It wasn't until 1970 that the American Heart Association decided, well, let's not just condemn saturated fats, let's ban or, or put a limit on all fats. Because the logic was fat, you know, there's only three macronutrients in your diet, fat, protein, and carbohydrate, and fat has nine calories per gram versus the four to five per gram that are contained in protein or carbohydrates. So if we limit fat, we'll just naturally limit calories. Mm -hmm. And so that will help control any kind of obesity, nascent obesity problem in the country. You know, without, it was just an idea. There was, there was no science behind it. There was, at that point, not a single clinical trial, which is the rigorous kind of science, not a single test of the low-fat diet, of a diet restricted in saturated fat and cholesterol. I mean, there was no science behind these recommendations when they were issued. Mm -hmm. But they were issued in the face of a panicked nation needing answers, demanding leadership on what they should do to prevent heart disease. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> and that is exactly <laughs> the that? reasoning. That was that was it. Like we recognize that we may not have all the answers, but we cannot imagine any negative unintended consequences. So pity us who mm -hmm. suffer from their lack of imagination. <laughs> Cause what, you know, the unintended consequences were really twofold by cutting down on saturated fats in butter, meat and cheese, uh, and in palm oil and coconut oil for Eastern populations, we shifted to polyunsaturated vegetable oils instead, safflower, sunflower oil, later canola oil, those kinds of oils. Those oils turned out in clinical trials to cause, not just be linked or maybe associated with, they actually caused higher death rates from cancer and are known to be potent in inflammatory, uh, to provoke inflammatory responses in the system. Um, and especially when heated, as they are used universally in French fry operations, they're used almost universally in restaurants for cooking. So they cause hundreds of inflammatory, de oxidized, degradation, degraded oxidation products. So it shifted us over to these vegetable oils with a lot of health harms and by reducing fat, what did we shift to? We shifted mm -hmm. over to carbohydrates. If you're not yeah. having eggs for breakfast, what are you eating? You're eating cereal the way that Kellogg wanted you to. Mm -hmm. You, as I did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, my whole, whole childhood story. was like Cocoa Krispies <laughs> and non-fat milk. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not having beef for dinner or pork loin, you're having pasta, which is also what happened in my family. Pasta, stir fry vegetables, mm -hmm. more rice, more grains. And so everybody switched over to a higher carbohydrate diet. And that is borne out in the statistics. From 1970 to today, we increased our carbohydrates by 30%. And we decreased fat since 1965, which again, going back to the American Heart Association mm -hmm. recommendation, we've decreased our fat consumption by, I'm going to have trouble remembering the statistic, but somewhere around 30%, I think, but maybe less. But we certainly decreased the amount of fat that we ate. And protein has stayed relatively constant. These recommendations were launched upon the American mm. public and subsequently exported to the entire world. We really became guinea pigs in an experiment where we had not given our consent and that had, you know, these recommendations were not based on any testing. 
It's so interesting to me. And later I realized, you know, would you ever be prescribed a drug that had not undergone a proper clinical mm -hmm. trial and an experiment, a test, you know, proper test that would not be allowed. And yet we were all prescribed a diet, which is perhaps far more, has far more impact than a drug potentially. Uh, we were all prescribed a diet that had never been tested. Some of it seems like we don't understand how powerful the food we eat is, right? So we just thought, oh yeah, it's not a drug. It's just what you eat. It can't be that bad. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think that- We don't have to test it. Well, you know? It's like, yeah, we don't, although it's really hard to test too. <laughs> and they did try. Well, so I guess two points here. One is that, correct, we didn't understand how important diet was because diet had evolved. You know, our meals, what we ate, our food culture had evolved over so many millennia. And so um, we didn't see it as a prescription for health. That's just the way it evolved so that we could be healthy. Humans could never have evolved if they didn't have nutritious diets. And so it evolved in a way that, that made us healthy, but we never recognized it as such. It was just our heritage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and then it entered the realm of the medical world where they took over diet. But even then, the crazy thing so shocked me in my research as I was going through, you know, the science, the history of the science is that when they finally did test Ansel Keys' hypothesis, the most tested hypothesis in the history of nutrition science. Because people certainly understood they had they had prescribed this diet to all the American public and they needed to <laughs> make sure that it was mm -hmm. it worked. Yeah. So a little belatedly, but they did do the experiments in the 60s and the 70s on it depends on your calculation, but I would say like 75,000 people were tested on the diets low in saturated fat and cholesterol and then maybe another no, tens of thousands were tested on the low fat diet overall. And, mm -hmm. and these were real tests where they, you know, the same as drug trials, half the people got the diet, half the people didn't. And many of these experiments were done in mental institutions where all the meals were controlled. So what we would call highly controlled experiments where you feed everybody all your meals. So you mm -hmm. really know what they're eating. I mean, it's, far better than the kind of the experiment that you often see today where people are just given a diet or a diet book in an hour of counseling week and told good luck. Go do it. Yeah. Um, so you can't even do those kinds of institutionalized experiments anymore today because they're considered rightly so unethical. unethical but yeah. so but they were a good experiment. Yeah, well, the Women's Health Initiative was not in Minute, institutions, but again, Minnesota it was another survey. national, yeah, the Women's Health Initiative, one of the largest nutrition trials ever on the low-fat diet funded by the National Institutes of Health, multi-center, multi-location, very, you know, $700 million invested in women. And they were basically all given, I mean, tens of thousands of women for seven to eight years, they were all given a copy of the dietary guidelines and just told, you know, follow the guidelines, reduce your fat, reduce your saturated fat, eat margarine instead of butter, lower your meat consumption. And at the end of that experiment, all the other experiments government funded trials, um, including these ones in institutions, they could not confirm that lowering fat or lowering your saturated fat had any benefit for health at all. Mm -hmm. Like did not increase your chances of staying slim, did not prevent type two diabetes, did not prevent cardiovascular mortality, which is a thing we really care about, did not prevent total mortality. I mean, which is your risk of dying of anything and did not prevent any kind of cancer in the trials that looked at cancer. They could not, the Women's Health Initiative especially looked at four different kinds of cancer, no effect on cancer. So, I mean, mm. there were really, there were no positive results to support these policies. But what happened was, is that these studies, and it seems impossible to believe, but they were just basically ignored. Mm -hmm. They weren't discussed, many of them. They became what's known as silent studies. They just disappeared. Nobody talked about them. They were buried. They were never directly reviewed by any of the expert committees that make up our dietary guidelines, our nation's nutrition policy. So they were just, they were just disappeared. It was too contradictory. It was mm -hmm. too uncomfortable to say, Look, we just got this wrong. <laughs> yeah. We need to we need to go back and rethink. And it always there was some explanation like, well, the trial wasn't powered well enough, it wasn't well done enough, it wasn't rigorous enough, it wasn't followed, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. But even if that's true, I mean, even accepting all of those criticisms, what you would say is, okay, 
those trials were all bad. More than $1 billion worth of studies. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, okay, they're all bad studies. None of them come up to standards. But then you say, okay, then we have to, let's just go back. Let's admit we know nothing. And if we know nothing, let's stop telling people what we've been telling them, which is cap your saturated fats at 10% of calories or 5 or 6% if you're an American Heart Association policy, you know, mm -hmm. eat the low fat diet. Let's just reverse out of all of that. If we don't have any evidence at all, let's just say, okay, we don't know. Mm -hmm. we, we don't mm -hmm. trust any evidence. So what's the famous quote where you found – the study that was buried, you know, they didn't publish it for a while and they buried it and why they didn't publish it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so that's the Minnesota coronary survey that was conducted. It was the biggest ever test of Ansel Keys's diet heart hypothesis. And it was carried out in five mental hospitals in Minnesota. And it had more than 9,000 men and women, one of the only experiments to also include women. And half the group ate nine percent of their calories as saturated fat so they were the ones with soy filled milk and soy filled burgers and margarine and the other half had 18 percent of their calories as saturated fat which was considered normal mm -hmm. but now we now would be way <laughs> over what we consider any anything normal but you know regular meat and cheese let's just say and butter mm -hmm. end of that experiment which lasted four and a half years they could not find that the low saturated fat group had any ben there was no benefit for cardiovascular or total mortality. And those results, I mean, Ansel Keys was originally on that study, although his name, he didn't put his name on the final paper, but they didn't publish their results for 16 years. And then this is an NIH funded <laughs> study. And the when they paper, finally yeah. did publish them, they put them in a, in a very out of the way journal that they knew nobody would read. I'm sure you've never heard of it. It's called ATVB. And mm. they knew that nutrition experts wouldn't read it. And then when Ivan France, who is one of the study leaders, a colleague of Ansel Keys, was asked, why did you not publish those, that study? He said, well, there was really nothing wrong with the study. We were just so disappointed in the way it came out. <laughs> <laughs> this is nutrition science for you. It's incredible. I mean, that is a form of, of lying, really, in, in yeah. science, which is, you know, you're supposed to publish your results, even if they don't come out the way you want them to. It's interesting, late, not so long ago, a team uh, of scientists, including one from NIH, went back and got the original magnetic tapes from that study in the basement of Ivan France and looked through them and discovered that he, they had never published some of their most significant findings. Um, and they, these were published in 2015 in the BMJ. And it, they said that actually, the more the men lowered their cholesterol, the more likely they were to die of a heart attack. Mm, yeah. Cholesterol is a good thing. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> cholesterol builds our cells. Yeah, I mean, cholesterol is in every cell of your body and you need it to function and to create your hormones and to have proper cellular membrane functioning. The, the demonization of cholesterol has been probably one of the, the greatest mistakes in medical history. And the opposite of that is replacing with vegetable oils. And we were talking about this when we were first filming, and a lot of people are talking about these days is it being maybe the biggest problem we're facing is the vegetable oils. I think that we don't know enough about vegetable oils. I think, you know, in all of these clinical trials, I've been talking about the ones in institutions where they, they swapped out saturated fat for polyunsaturated vegetable oils. As I said, they consistently showed higher death rates from cancer. Mm -hmm. There was so much serious concern about that. There was a series of high-level meetings at the NIH that they hosted in the early 1980s, and they tried to figure out what was going on with this so-called side effect, hear my air quotes, mm -hmm. of cancer, and they could not figure it out. They really just didn't understand why this was happening, and they said, well, it is so important to lower cholesterol in the public overall that we were, were just going to pretty much ignore this cancer effect. So that's really <laughs> a little terrifying. I think the scariest part of my book uh, was researching the effects of these vegetable oils, which didn't even exist in the food supply until the early 1900s. You know, they were used, they were invented to lubricate machinery as you know in the industrial revolution in the late 1800s when they ran they ran out of whale oil because they hunted all the whales they turned to cottonseed oil originally initially which was a byproduct of the cotton crop in the south of the united states to lubricate the machinery of the industrial revolution 
And then Procter and Gamble got the idea that if they could stabilize this gray sludgy oil and deodorize it and winterize it and degummify it and all the things they do in this super long process mm. that they could make that into something they could sell as a food item uh. originally as crisco introduced in 1911 so that, that's how it entered our food supply it's, yum it's yum <laughs> but a lot, you know a lot of people don't i mean yeah i just wish just this whole like vegan vegetarian population will just kind of <laughs> take a look at that part like how yeah, much it's processing hard it for the through. vegans. Much, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hard for there's sort of two food movements that are a little bit in conflict with each other, which is that there is this local natural food movement that I associate with, say, Michael Pollan, but they're also vegetarian and increasingly vegan, many of them. But, you know, how do they get their fats? Natural fats mm -hmm. are butter and lard, right? I mean, I know lard is a, like a disgusting word to most people, but the reality is before 1900, the sole cooking fats for most Western populations were butter and lard. Mm -hmm and tallow and suet and you know other animal fats to a lesser extent but um if you're going vegan you can't eat animal fats or you're then what do you you must turn to this heavily industrialized product which is vegetable oils which comes out of like a 16 you know step process that's only available from a factory to supply your fat needs in the u.s nowadays it's mainly soybean oil just to give you an idea about, you know, how our diet has changed, we eat, so we ate 0% of our calories as vegetable oils because they didn't exist in the year 1900. And by the year 2000, we, we ate eight to 9% of all of our calories as vegetable oils. So we had increased, we'd increased our consumption by like 121,000 times. <laughs> yeah. And I think we don't fully know how it, it and there's, there's a lot of interesting thinking about how it interferes with basic metabolism, how it weakens cellular structure, vegetable oils, the individual fatty acids become lodged in your cell membrane. They replace the more stable fatty acids in those cell membranes. And that has an effect on all the products that the cell creates i mean it's it's very deep and complex how what a significant effect these fatty acids have on your cells especially when heated yeah yeah they're and they're just not natural products so i mean i think that it's may go part of the way to explain like many people don't think that carbohydrates alone really explains the obesity epidemic or diabetes yeah. or all of the diseases we're suffering from and um, I'm sympathetic to those arguments because there are all kinds of contradictory, there's a, there's a lot of contradictory evidence out there. Or societies that live on carbohydrates and are fine because they're unrefined and they're not eating the vegetable oils. That were there. Yeah, they're not baked into the carbohydrates. They're eating potatoes. Exactly. Vegetable oils may be part of the answer for you know why our particular way of eating in the West has been so toxic to us. Yeah. Who knows? We got. All, I'm here to figure it out. I'm. I'm open ears, but yeah, I don't think some people. They're just in our sort of world. They're just like sugar's bad. Like Gary Taubes is just a hundred percent sugar's a problem. But then there are ways to show that you know there's people who eat sugar and are fine, or you can eat maybe a sugar in moderation. It isn't actually poisonous, but then maybe the vegetable oils are the thing that are actually bad. Well, well, here's what we do know. I think here's what the evidence is. We know that sugar can be really addicting for people. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, it is a unique kind of carbohydrate in that people feel I highly compelled to eat it. Well, yeah. um, and so that has its own toxic effect. But what I think the clinical trial literature shows, um, which is to say what the rigorous science shows is that, that we still don't know exactly what causes many of these diseases, but we can say that disease reversal, which is to say long-term sustainable weight loss and reversal of type 2 diabetes can happen by decreasing total carbohydrates really yeah. not distinguishing between the type of carbohydrate oh yeah i'm not trying to back up carbs or sugar <laughs> no no no. <laughs> i'm just i'm like i'm just yeah, yeah. trying to like make it clear for the audience out there definitely well um, there's 77 like, studies now you mentioned it before but there's growing number of studies there's a spreadsheet with 77 so far well so we've yeah. updated that spreadsheet um with a researcher and there's easily over 100 clinical trials oh, awesome. now so we're gonna put that up in the nutrition coalition soon 
there are a lot of studies and it does seem to be the case, although I can't say conclusively, it does seem to be the case that it's just the total amount of carbs that you eat that is the relevant factor. So if you want those carbs to be a lemon gumdrop, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> they, that mean, and you're able to keep it at two lemon gumdrops and not 700 of them, like that yeah. may be okay. <laughs> um, but, well, that's so, not realistic. Okay, I okay. This is a bigger topic that maybe you can weigh in on for a second. Is that some people like I don't know? Is it Kevin Bass or these like research type people or uh, even Lane Norton type of people? They're like, yeah, technically, if you eat in a deficit, you know, you can have a Twizzler and a Twix bar, but it's like this is not reality. We're not looking at for one people's satiety that how hungry they are and you know trying to manage this deficit that they're trying to do or if it's you know if they're how it actually works in real life you're talking about meta they're talking about metabolic ward studies and they're talking about okay well in this control situation when we trapped people in and fed them you know this it was there was no difference between carbs and fat but that's not reality that's not what happened so there's a huge difference so that's kind of why i brought up the sugar it's like i mean maybe you know technically the sugar molecule is just you know glucose and fructose and well you know fructose is bad for your liver and excess but just the fact glucose you know we can just burn glucose our bodies have been burning glucose for a while i'd say way too much (laughs) lately but technically there's nothing wrong but that's just not reality yeah i think that's why there are two kinds of questions you want to answer which is you know one of them is what can people do in the real world that's the most interesting question because here we have a real world where 60 percent of america is diagnosed with at least one chronic disease and most of the diet related disease and most of those are are tied into obesity in some way Mm -hmm. and then the other one is well tech you know in a in like what is the mechanism by which all this is happening? And that's why you go to metabolic ward studies and you try to figure out, well, what, you know, exactly what happened to the human body. So there's so much to say here, but I think that the metabolic ward studies are flawed. This is where they actually lock people up in a Mm -hmm. metabolic chamber. They, you know, by necessity, because people don't want to be locked up for long periods of time, Mm -hmm. they're short-term experiments. Well, I think that we, many people understand that if you are shifting from a glucose-based fuel to becoming a fat burner, where you, you basically reduce your, your glucose intake, your carbohydrate intake, and shift over to becoming using fat ketone bodies for fuel, that's a really, that can be for some people months, a mm-hmm. really long process. So yeah. these short-term metabolic studies are, to my mind, really not so meaningful. Uh, I don't Absolutely. know why they keep doing them for Absolutely. like, I've been in touch with Kevin Hall, who's done a number of them. And I, that's said, what I was trying to think of Kevin. Hall. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've said to him, why do you keep um, designing these one month long studies? I mean, it's just so well established in the literature that people take, you know, really six weeks is the absolute minimum for conversion into the ketogenic diet. So yeah. I don't know what the real answer is there, but I think that, um, the real world studies are much more interesting. And I think that you're absolutely right in the sense like, well, what does work with people? I mean, most people having sweets just triggers them. Mm-hmm. And and there are studies to show that it actually, that it actually like sparks your appetite to mm-hmm. eat and it encourages you to eat more. It increases your hunger to have a load of glucose in your system. So that's just not a realistic, it's not realistic for people. The more they can have more success in the long term by trying to just eliminate their taste for sweetness altogether. And Absolutely. Um, so those are the kind of studies that are meaningful. I mean, to me, the most groundbreaking rock star study there is out there, even though it's not randomized, is the study that was done by Sarah Hallberg out of the University of Indiana on hundreds of people where they started with established diabetes with an average of eight years living with diabetes. And they at year one, 60% of them had reversed their diagnosis of diabetes or put it into remission, however you want to say. And at year two, that number was at 54%. So the main thing that happens in diet studies where people can't sustain their results. I mean, Mm -hmm. in this case, they had largely sustained them. Yeah. This is, why isn't the whole world talking about this? Can you imagine if that were a drug or, you know, like half the people could reverse their diabetes at least get off all their medications. 
it's unheard of in drug but yeah so tell us why no one's talking about it this i i guess i heard you on a clip with dr mark hyman talking about this why why are why is the world why are we shouting this from the rooftops why not um uh -huh. i'll tell you a story which is that i worked with dr halberg to write an op-ed about the study and we tried to get it placed in newspapers all over the country it was actually accepted by um fox dot com or fox mm -hmm. you know and, and they were gonna mm -hmm. they were gonna publish it which is a pretty good outlet in terms of their reach mm -hmm. and they and literally it, it was then this is almost unheard of the on-air doctor nixed the idea because he said look the, i you know i've been telling people all my life to eat a low-fat diet and this just this just contradicts everything i've been saying <laughs> and <laughs> you know I, I tell you that anecdote because i think it just encapsulates in a nutshell why we do not see this in the media what mm -hmm. has the media been telling the media is like other institutions their institutions they have been they have been selling low fat diet and promoting it for decades and so and they believe in it and that's been their institutional history they don't want to be flip-flopping on their publics their their editors their everybody believes in it i had another incident when i first started doing my research and i did a story it's a you know a smaller outlet but self magazine i did a story on saturated fats for mm -hmm. them and they loved it and the editor loved it and she sent it up to editorial chain and it came back and said we're killing this story because it goes against everything we've been telling our readers for so long. Mm. And you know, you can think of other explanations as well. Okay, so much of the media is funded by pharmaceutical companies. How many of those ads do you listen to on television and in other places and you know, these websites? And do pharmaceutical companies love it when people get off all their medication and are no longer taking four to five pills a day like the average American? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> that is, you know, you just can't. It's unfortunate, but it's and it feels so cynical to say this. But of course, that's true. They don't want to be you're you know, you represent zero profit if you're healthy. And the food industry is the ones that are paying for all the commercials, too, just with the foods, the food industry. I mean, all the public health institutions and the foundations that have invested themselves in this. And there's another factor here that I think is worth mentioning, although you know, I hesitate in doing so, but the reality is, is that people who go on a lar low carb diet tend to, not always, but tend to eat more animal foods, mm -hmm. right? Because what are the foods with fat and protein yeah. naturally? They're meat, they're cheese, eggs. There is a growing number, there's a growing power behind the, the groups that really believe we should stop eating animal foods. And they are the animal rights movement, which has always been very powerful in the United States, but has become more so. All the people who are invested, the huge corporate investments in meat replacements, which is the impossible burger on down there, just it is one of the fastest growing investment sectors out there. And this um, growing number, really powerful number of investors who believe and public institutions who believe that we simply cannot afford to eat animal foods for um, because they're too damaging to the climate. So we must give up meat, if not also dairy, in order to prevent climate change. Mm. So mm. the four, and so they associate the low carb diet with increased consumption, fairly so, with increased consumption of those yeah. foods. And, they're, and so for them, this diet is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not to well, mention the whole carnivore us. movement. I mean, forget <laughs> them. <laughs> oh my God. They hate us well i'm not i guess I, i'm like part of it I, I guess i do eat mostly animal foods but I'm, i've never said i was carnivore i'm lumped in now for sure well you know my favorite plant food is wine <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, wait let's talk about it for a second yeah what do you what do you think of carnivore because i i'm like 90 95 percent animal foods uh, yeah i got caught in the whole kale spinach shake train and did that for years yeah. and i feel like i did some damage and these animal foods are where it's at are you kind of of that? Um, I definitely have come to have a better understanding of how much more nutrient dense and rich those foods are, right? You know, yeah. the greatest vitamin on the planet is liver. Yeah. You can, you know, that red meat is more nutrient, far more nutrient dense than white meat. That, um, And then I did attend um, some talks on these subjects and I came to learn 
mainly through Georgia Ede, who's really interesting on this subject. Mm, she's, a, yeah. she's a psychiatrist, about the various toxins that are in plant foods that many people are intolerant to. You know, many people are reluctant carnivores. Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't want to be, but they just found that those foods were making them sick you know, broccoli and I believe kale also are, you know, rich in oxalates, um, which inhibit iodine absorption. I hope I'm getting that right. But, you know, other foods have yeah, lectins. And, and yeah, yeah. so, and so a lot of people cannot tolerate that or they, they, they actually have a toxic reaction to it. So that really interested me. And, and there are nightshade vegetables that some people are intolerant to. And of course, there's none of that is part of the average discourse in the population. And so I became, and I think that, you know, in terms of our grains and our wheats, and they have evolved in a way in the United States in that very highly processed way where they've been stripped of their natural nutrients. And, and so what we're eating now is nothing like what our ancestors ate. Mm -hmm. I became much more sympathetic to this idea, well, do we need them? I don't think we need the fiber in plant foods. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know yet. There, I think we need to study it further. I mean, I, my Twitter feed is full of the most rapturous people talking about their journey to being a carnivore. But, you know, there are also people who try it and just say it's not for me. It didn't mm. work. Not for me. And I think we just don't know enough yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of there. I'm just I'm never going to just go out and join a camp anyway. <laughs> you know, it's just like, let's figure it out. I'll move a direction. And it's very interesting to learn about these things. And I have had improvements eating more animal foods. Well, that's good. I think what is really exciting about the paradigm shift that we are in, and I think we are in a paradigm shift. I mean, just to give two markers of the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. You know, we started off this conversation by talking about the intransients in Washington, D.C. And yet, what have we seen happen over the last five years? We have seen the cholesterol caps be dropped. Mm -hmm. All the reasons people were avoiding egg yolks and shellfish no longer right? Those caps have been dropped. And we have seen any language about a low fat diet being dropped yeah. from the American Heart Association, the US dietary guidelines, the two most powerful sets of nutrition policies in the country. Okay, so let's, you know, granted, there's no press announcement, they didn't tell the American public, they just tiptoed away from that advice, which is your know, two pillars of our nutrition advice over mm -hmm. the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. But still, that's change. That is real change. And I think that we are in a paradigm shift. And the great power that is pushing for change is two things. The one is the spectacular results of the science. Did we even think reversal of diabetes was possible? Mm -hmm. Now we know it is. Like that's incredible. So that is happening. And I think the grassroots movement of people seeing their friends, their neighbors, their dog groomers, their mm -hmm. care stylists, like everybody, like transforming themselves. The power of the grassroots where you just can't deny it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's huge. Well, I want to talk to you about this because you're doing this on a high level. The Nutrition Coalition is awesome. You're going to Washington to high level. Then there's the doctors and just regular people who are changing people's lives one by one. And then when they see these stupid articles saying, oh, keto diet's gonna kill you, or this kind of thing, they're like, no, I don't believe you. I just lost 140 pounds and I feel amazing. Like you, you gotta hit it from all sides. And then when it, you, people who actually know the difference it's made that don't buy into this kind of propaganda type stuff. The reason I think that you have to attack this from the top down as well as from the bottom up is that people should be hearing this advice from their doctors. They should not, I mean, I'm super, I feel like I have a privilege and joy for me to talk about this subject as it is for you. But really people, when they go to their doctors, their nurses, their dietitians, their nutritionists, they should be getting this advice from experts. Mm -hmm. Like nobody loves a world in which we cannot trust our experts. And the reality is a lot of people can hear advice from people like you and me or experiment on their own or they have a sort of maverick frame of mind or they challenge they they don't mind mm -hmm. challenging institutions. But many, many people just feel so uncomfortable doing that. I mean, I always tell the story of my mom who has like my mom has like read my book and she loves me and you know, but if I tell her 
don't eat that low fat yogurt, mom. It's higher in sugar. She'll say like, okay, honey, I'll talk to my doctor about it. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. So there are a lot of people like my, you know, beloved mom who just, they do not want to distrust their authorities and they should not have to. I mean, mm -hmm. we should have it. It should be true that people get the advice from their trusted health professionals. And beyond that, even if you can fix your own health, what about your kid getting their lunch in school? When you go to the hospital, what about, you know, people serving in the military, that homes, you know, the, the food that's in nursing homes, the, the food, I mean, all of that food is determined by the dietary guidelines. And that will not change until the guidelines change. Your kid will never be able to get whole milk. They will, would rather give them sugar, low, non-fat milk with 50 grams of sugar in it than they will give them whole milk. It's crazy. It's super important. Some doctors can't even prescribe things, right? It, it's the, the standard of care isn't even right. Many so right. Them. If you belong to a large medical practice, you risk medical malpractice if you teach people a diet such as a low carb diet that is not considered the gold standard. So until it's included in the dietary guidelines, which for better or worse are considered the backstop gold standard for all nutrition advice, it's not available as an option. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it's so important because it, the guidelines just have this stranglehold on what people are allowed to recommend, talk about, discuss, have taught in medical schools, have taught in nutritionist classes. Like you just, it's going to remain this banned option until it's offered as an official, you know, as an official dietary pattern. That's amazing that you just said that because I'm trying to present in the film dietary pattern b <laughs> all right you know what, what why isn't there a dietary pattern b like we can see that one side can work technically you know if you you know i you see healthy people who are eating lots of fruits and vegetables and you know lean chicken and you know it is possible so that's dietary pattern a right it's possible if you eat no sugars or fine grains vegetables but what about dietary pattern B? Like, for one thing, no one should recommend a one size fits all diet. And I agree with that too. I don't think everyone needs to be 95% carnivore like me or whatever. But will there be a dietary pattern B? Is, is that what something that you're asking them? It's like, is that even too confusing? Like, what if there's a poster and there's like two different ways to eat? It, it sounds super complicated, just me talking about it. Well, I mean, the main, the, the focus of my group is to ensure that guidelines that they just do the science properly. Like they don't ignore mm -hmm. the science, they review it in like systematically, which they haven't been doing, which you know, they're not following international standards and how to review the science. They're, they've ignored and excluded science, which we've talked about. I mean, there's these billion dollars worth of trials they've never looked at. I mean, my group is really just focused on the, just do the science correctly. Mm -hmm. And we have faith that if the science is done correctly, it will come out to, you know, if the science is not ignored, then it will come out. Um, we have faith that it would, I have faith that, that it could come out with a range of dietary options, as you say. Like people who are metabolically unhealthy cannot eat a diet with more than 50% of carbohydrates, which is what the U yeah. dietary guidelines currently recommends for all Americans. So, you know, my hope is that you could just invest in good science and it would come out the right way. And I think like, for instance, in the 2015, the dietary guidelines come around every five years. The last time it, you know, we found out from Freedom of Information Act acquisitions of emails that expert committee had reviewed a low carb diet and then they stuffed that review like mm. they didn't put it in their report they didn't publish it they there was a member of the committee that that protested and said it's a large body of evidence we shouldn't bury it i mean it's really it's sort of cloak and dagger kind of thing but you know if they didn't do that we would have decent guidelines i think so our hope is just to have like our hope is you know we are really pushing for proper science to be done properly evidence-based you know dietary guidelines evidence-based policy where the science is not ignored or buried or or it's not weak studies are not prioritized over strong studies the way it currently is i mean if they could just do a proper job of reviewing the science we would be fine mm -hmm. well yeah no, i love that so that's like step one and that's a realistic goal but do you have like a vision I'm wondering, you know, of just like how they could even present this information to the public as just a second dietary pattern. I think it's 
you know, I think, you know, if you have more than a hundred clinical trials supporting a low carb dietary pattern, that it, it easily would be one of the, the options that's offered by the dietary guidelines. I mean, just to give you a sense, there are three current patterns, the vegetarian option supported by zero clinical trials. They couldn't find any clinical <laughs> trials to support that option. It gave the, the grade of evidence that they gave that diet was um, C. You could get A, B, or C if for any, and, mm -hmm. and they got a grade of C. The Mediterranean diet is really supported by, um, was two clinical trials. One of them was recently retracted and reissued, but has serious questions about its data still. And so, and the, the so-called, the third one is the U.S. Diet, diet, which is really the DASH diet, the dietary alternative to, to stop hypertension. It's a diet that has only been tested in clinical trials on only hypertensive middle-aged Americans, only in trials lasting four to six months at the longest, and um, like only on about, I mean, maximum 1,200 people. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's crazy it's to insane. say like, it, here we have, we have, we have three dietary patterns based on almost no evidence. So it seems logical to me that you could have a fourth dietary pattern based on a lot more evidence. But again, we're not dealing in the realm of, of logic. So um, I, I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. It's, it's full circle back to you thought you were digging into science, you're digging into story of politics. And, and it's a lot about paradigm shift and it's about generational knowledge and there's a lot going on. But okay, I guess you have to go in a second. <laughs> I do. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I know I would, I would talk about this for hours. It's just so maddening when you like hear it laid out like this and it's it's great talking to you about this stuff because you're kind of the forefront working at the high level and i'm gonna try i want to try to hit the mid-level too the mid-level i guess is a movie i don't know you high level you know individual people level and then let's get some films out there to mm -hmm. just educate people and that's how people educate themselves these days it's power, more powerful than a study netflix is more powerful than a study it seems well, you know, here's like my hat is off to you and all my, you know, good thought wishes and thoughts are going your way. I hope that you can get that movie out because I completely agree that is it need there needs to be just they're accessible, really great stories that tell this story. And, and you know, that's the way people consume information now. So <laughs> let's do it. Well, yeah, I was uh, I was worried at first that you were in Vinny's film Fat. And then it was going to be the same thing. But, you know, he just covered the story of what went wrong. We're trying to do way more. We're giving way more experts. We're going to evolution. We're going into the environment that you talked about that we didn't even talk about much. If You know, that this is basically untrue about cows and the environment. And I think we're going to present something really well with tons of graphics and tons of stuff to make people understand nutrition finally, understand food. So Well, I that would be fantastic. I mean... You know, when I came out with my book and there was an effort to say, oh, you just plagiarized Gary Taubes, it's the same thing. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to say how many books, had, and I did come out with, you know, Gary wrote a statement saying this is not plagiarism. And, and I, you know, and my book covers m much, a great deal of other material. But one of the things that, you know, that my arguments was how many books are there in World War II? Like mm -hmm. how many times does this story need to be told? And when you, t you t this is possibly the greatest scientific mistake of two generations right yeah is do we just tell it once and then say oh we're done <laughs> yeah <laughs> it needs to be told a hundred different times in a hundred different ways and everybody has a unique angle into it and every you know the story is it's a huge story and everybody it just needs to be told again and again and again and again until people understand it well, I agree. I mean, I'm helping people. There's a guy contacting me. He's like, I want to make a film similar to yours and I want to go to film in Australia and then you know, all these, tell the story of it's, and I'm like, yeah, I'll help you. Let's do it. You know, right. let's do it. Let's, let's spread the word. I'll let you go. And I guess, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when the film com comes out. But we'll wait. be in touch. It's great right. to talk to you, Brian. Thank okay, you thanks for having so much. me on your show. And that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Please rate this on iTunes or any other podcast app. Please support us on Patreon. Please subscribe on social media. Please do all the things. Go to sapien.org and find everything. Find the new Sapien show and stay happy and healthy. That's it. Peace.